was educated here, uh, and then I, I finished my military service, and then I left for the United States uh, to do my bachelor's at UC Berkeley. And, uh, and I spent three years there. I graduated and went off to uh, MIT to do my PhD for about five years. Uh, and then I did a short postdoctoral uh, stint at Stanford before coming back here to NUS, uh, the chemistry department. Um, uh, how I, what, what, what does my research group do? Uh, we, we work on these tiny uh, semiconductor nanoparticles. They're very tiny crystals of semiconductor that when you get to the nanoscale, they're about 1 to 10 nanometers in diameter, they start to exhibit very interesting properties such as quantum mechanical effects. Um, so for example, if you take a, uh, one of the semiconductors that we make, cadmium selenide, uh, and you, you have a certain size, say about 5 nanometers or so, it emits uh, about orangish red color. But if you make that same particle smaller, say about one nanometer or so, then it starts to emit blue. So just based on the size alone, you can already change the colors. And you don't see this kind of phenomena in uh, normal materials, uh, conventional materials. So it's something special. Um, we investigate this, these uh, semiconductor nanomaterials in the context of uh, applications such as photovoltaics and uh, and LEDs, um, and also lasers. So they, they actually can make good uh, materials for, for these uh, applications. Um, how did I get into this field? Well, it's a, it's a pretty interesting story, actually. Uh, I was a, I think a year or two undergrad, and I, I wanted to get into research, as is the culture in Berkeley. A lot of uh, students there, in their second year or so, would uh, enroll in some research program. And so just like everyone else, I wanted to see what research was all about. So I approached this theorist, a very, very famous theorist, actually. And he said, uh, and I said, uh, well, I, you know, I'm really interested in what you do. Because at that time, I was really into physical chemistry. And he was a physical chemistry theorist. And I said, you know, I was really interested in what you do. Uh, can I join your group and, uh, and, and learn how to do theory? In, in physical chemistry. In, in particular, he was working on liquids, the behavior of liquids. And uh, he said, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't take in any undergrads into my, into my research group. And so he saw the really disappointed look on my face. And so he said, well, you know, have you heard about quantum dots? You know, have you heard about quantum dots? And I said, well, that's a fancy name, but no, I've never heard about quantum dots. And he says, Ah, well, let me tell you, uh, there is a professor, a colleague of mine uh, in, in our department who works on this magical material, quantum dots. Maybe you want to go look him up. You know, his name is Paul Alavisadas. And so that's how I, uh, I, I knocked on Paul Alavisadas' door and uh, he said, uh, sure, I, I, I give you a, you know, maybe a year to try, see if you like it. If you like it, then then that's great. It'll be a good uh, research experience for you. And that turned out to be the best decision that ever happened to me. Uh, I, think, I think in retrospect, theory would not have suited me so well. So I started to learn about these quantum dots, which are, is the research I'm doing now, these semiconductor nanoparticles. Uh, and I got so interested in it that I stayed on two years, you know, my, my, my last final year in Berkeley as well. And then even after two years, I didn't have enough of it. You know, I couldn't get enough of that. I said, oh, I got to go study graduate school uh, on this material. And so I went to MIT just for, to study quantum dots. So that's my journey. And I haven't looked back since. I still do quantum dots, uh, also called semiconductor nanoparticles to this day. Yeah, so that's how I got into this, this field of research. Um, a lot. Well, of course, I have to give that answer. Uh, so, you know, a regular day at work. So, when does it start? Uh, typically, a little before nine or so. And uh, first thing I would do is I want to see. If I'll, I'll check my emails, as maybe most people do, to see if there's anything urgent I need to respond to. So that's not so different from maybe most of the working population. 
uh, if I don't have teaching duties, then the day starts mostly with trying to figure out what the lab has been doing. And that happens through meetings with the PhD students and the graduate students and the FYP students. Um, I set up the meetings, so I actually set up regular meetings with them. Uh, and then at some point, uh, maybe that, that might take the whole morning actually. Um, at some point in the afternoon, I will actually go to the lab myself to see on the ground what's going on and sort of uh, give advice where, 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 uh, where I can, sometimes unsolicited. <laughs> and, um, and then there, there are very often times where I have to travel to say NTU or, or ASTAR to uh, catch up with my collaborators uh, on projects that we work on. And sometimes we have joint meetings uh, in order to discuss what is the way forward with a particular project that we're all working on, or what are the, some of the updates from their side, and we have to actually uh, uh, meet at some location. Sometimes they come to NUS, sometimes have to go over to their side, to be fair. Uh, so that is you know, a typical day. Um, reading papers has become a, a little more difficult to do during the day, so I have to do it at night. And also writing papers. Uh, reading and writing, equally important. Writing may be, in some ways, more important than reading. Um, so I have to do those activities uh, off, you know, off office hours, out of office hours. Um, that might sound like academia is a very demanding job, but actually, you know, it, it's very flexible. You know, if you don't have uh, teaching duties, then uh, you can, you, you know, the, the you, you, you know, your time is, you, you plan your own time. At the end of the day, you just have to make sure that you have a decent uh, research output. So, um, let me start with my lab, because that's what I'm familiar with. So my lab is, uh, is more of a, I'm, I'm a physical chemist, so the, the way that I approach problems are more of a, from a physical chemistry standpoint, and therefore the, the students and the postdocs in my lab mostly come from a more physical chemistry or even a physics background. Uh, I do have postdocs in my lab who are pure physicists, and um, uh, some of them have skill sets in uh, spectroscopy or optoelectronic de devices in physics. Um, and we do some amount of synthesis, so as a physical chemist, we're not that con uh, conventional either. So physical chemists, one might think of, uh, the, at least the older physical chemists, used to stay in the laser lab all day, pretty much, or you're some kind of theorist and you stay behind your computer all day. Uh, but my students and, and postdocs do spend a considerable amount of their time uh, working in the syn synthesis lab, so they, they, they do quite a lot of synthesis. That said, I don't think we can consider ourselves like the organic chemists or the inorganic chemists whose real focus is on synthesis. Um, so that maybe gives you some idea of the, the background. Uh, what kind of knowledge do they typically have? They have some, you know, knowledge of, uh, of course on physics and uh, physical chemistry, um, but also solid state uh, uh, physics in particular, or um, solid state chemistry. That is uh, a recurring theme in the lab, just by the nature of our work, because we're de dealing with semiconductor nanoparticles, and so uh, uh, solid state physics is, is quite often uh, brought up. Um, so, in general, if you're talking about in general, what kind of knowledge do you need um, for maybe a broader uh, broader uh, discipline, not say quantum dots, but nanoscience in general, then it, it is broad enough that I think almost all the chemistry disciplines have a role to play. So that it might be a disappointing answer or it might be a, a good answer for those aspiring to join the field that, you know, it's not limited to physical chemistry. Now, analytical chemists also play a, a role in, in nanoscience. There's, there are some very good analytical chemists that I know of, 
uh, who are doing very good work on gold nanoparticles, for example, just figuring out how many atoms there are in a single gold nanoparticle and using all the analytical techniques they have to figure out, well, in one gold nanoparticle of some size, how many atoms do I have? That, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it involves very many disciplines from all over chemistry. A lot of the basic research that was being done uh, in, in the field is now being translated into industrial products. One of the products uh, that has been getting quite a lot of press recently is the quantum dot TVs, quantum dot televisions. It's been making a splash on the, uh, for example, the Las Vegas uh, Consumer Electronics Show, uh, I think late last year uh, or, or maybe early this year. Um, and what's doing? What it's doing is is, is generating industry industrial uh, opportunities. So if you talk about job prospects, then there are openings. You know, there, there are job openings that relate to my field. Uh, they're starting to open up. Um, there are a, a few major players right now, uh, and for Quantum Dot Televisions, uh, it started with Sony. Uh, who went in 2013, and now uh, LG and Samsung have also gone in. So with these huge companies, and the, the, we're talking big volumes of production, then the companies that are supplying them with the quantum dots, um, for example, Nanoco, uh, QD Vision, uh, and so on, these companies will obviously need to hire people with expertise in quantum dots. And, uh, and so if you have a quantum dot expertise, at least now, uh, the job prospects are looking better and better every day. Um, and uh, Sigma Aldrich, for example, also produces quantum dots, um, or at least they purchased the company that produced quantum dots. And so they, you know, if you had that skill set, maybe you could be hired by either Sigma Aldrich or... So the job prospects are, are, are looking better as the, as the field starts to mature and lots of the basic research are being translated into products uh, that people use. Well, I mean, as an academic, the, the research that we do uh, should be, as always, uh, the creation of new knowledge. And I think the, you know, the, the impact may only be felt much later. The, the immediate impact when you create new knowledge is just uh, a lot of people in the field, at least, who, who are very curious about phenomena are satisfied that you have an explanation for it. But if you talk about societal impact, that might come later. So, well, for one example that I can think of is the, the quorum dot TVs. Uh, the research started in the late 90s, uh, and it really never got seriously taken until about 2001, 2002. And then they started to realize they could make a real display or LED out of these, this quantum dot material. And in 2006, they actually formed a company uh, to make this display uh, out of quantum dots. And of course, uh, you know, six, seven years later, uh, seven, eight years later, we now have products on, on the shelves that boast uh, better uh, picture quality than conventional LCD screens or even the conventional LEDs that you, you find today. And it also advantages over OLED TVs. But that took a long time. That took a long time. So um, I would say I would say that my answer to your question would be creation of new knowledge. But the first thing the student has to, you know, they, they have to ask themselves, are you really you know, curious about something? It can't be you're curious about everything. It's it's tough to be curious about everything, you know, with in in in, in with intense passion. Because I don't know if someone can have that much passion. Maybe it's possible, but it's unlikely. So if there's some area that you're really passionate, or you're really interested in, that should be the first step towards considering graduate school. Um, and then after you figure that out, then you 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 know what area you like then maybe it's also a good idea to figure out, well, who are some of the people, or at least even if you don't have a very specific area like mine, uh, in my case it was quantum dot, so it made it very easy for me. I picked out a particular person I would join. But let's say you're just very interested in 
uh, nanoscience, for example, um, which is fairly broad, then you can ask yourself, um, well, who are the best nanoscience people out there? What schools you know, do very good nanoscience? And ask yourself, uh, well, you, would you like to commit four or five years of your time to the PhD program? Um, so th those are the beginning steps. And then after that, you really have to have the uh, determination to, uh, to, and perseverance, actually. Grad school, a lot of it is perseverance as well, because it, no matter how brilliant you are, you, know, you will undoubtedly have a lot of failure. Um, and the, one of the ways to succeed in grad school, one of the uh, important things you, that allow you to succeed in grad school is, is to be able to accept your failure and to make sure that doesn't get you down and prevent you from you know, trying to solve, uh, to overcome those failures. Because they're, especially in the t very top schools, they're very, very brilliant students. They top their own undergraduate colleges, wherever they're from, in the whole world. So for example, at MIT. And then they, they come to MIT. And what I've seen is, um, yeah, they can get very disappointed because in, in college, nothing, they had no challenge. They scored, they aced everything. They took, you know, more classes than other students and still aced everything. And then when you go to grad school, and you find that the, the problem's new. No one even knows there's a solution. It's not a textbook problem anymore. And, uh, and then you gotta be smart about it. You gotta realize when it, you can't solve it, and then you gotta pick up your losses and find something else to do. Or maybe there's a clever way around this thing, and um, you know, and then maybe you can solve it in, a, in a, another way, but it, not exactly what you originally intended. So uh, that, that's kind of important as well. So that would be uh, my advice to people trying to go this long journey towards uh, being an academic. 